invite you to find your seats and let's prepare our hearts to worship God as people join us not only here in person but also online. May God bless you. All right. Our scripture lesson this morning is from Acts chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles and would like to turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and I'll be reading the first 11 verses uh, as our text this morning. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. And a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who was, has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, once again, we thank you for your presence. And now, Lord, by your spirit and by your word, would you touch every heart? Would you shape us, mold us, make us more like you? Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. In preparation for this uh, message this morning, uh, it occurred to me I have never preached on the ascension. <laughs> okay? Uh, maybe you find that hard to believe. Maybe you don't know. But uh, after uh, 40 some years of ministry and pastoring churches and preaching in different places around the world, I don't think I've ever preached on the ascension of Jesus. And, and I was part of a denomination, part of a Methodist uh, church denomination, uh, where we, we acknowledged uh, Ascension Day, which was last Thursday, by the way, May 21st, was Ascension Day. Uh, and then next Sunday, May 31st, will be Pentecost Sunday. But the 21st was the Ascension, a remembrance of the Ascension. And, uh, and so this is As- Ascension Sunday, if you will. Uh, But it occurred to me that I had never preached on the ascension of Jesus. And never, never thought about it too much. Just that that was what happened. But this morning, I'm so excited about this message. Because there was a reason for the ascension. There's a purpose for the ascension. It's part of the essential truths of the gospel, by the way. 
Uh, you have the, uh, the, the doctrines and the creeds that we say. Uh, he, he died on the cross. He was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended back into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, from thence, he will come to uh, return and to judge the world. On and on. You know the creeds and the doctrines of the church. It's right there. But it's one of the essential truths of the gospel. And let me tell you why. First of all, let me tell you what the gospel is. Uh, first of all, you have the incarnation. Uh, that's when Jesus stepped off of the throne. The Son of God stepped off of the throne in eternity in heaven. Put on flesh and blood and came into this world in the form of a helpless little baby. Conceived in the womb of Mary, the Virgin Mary. That's what we celebrate at Christmas is the incarnation. And, and when Jesus got off the throne and came into the world uh, as, as an infant, uh, he was fully human. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't, uh, he was God, but he laid aside his power. He laid aside his glory and he entered into this world as a helpless little baby. And there was a reason for that. He emptied himself of his glory in order that he might be one of us so that we might learn how to become like him. He humbled himself. We can't even imagine. You know, can you imagine the humility it would take for you to become an ant on the floor? You'd have to humble yourself really. <laughs> that would be an incredible humiliation for a human being to come become an ant. Well, you can't even imagine how far it was for the Son of God to humble himself and to become a human, one of the creatures that he made. He was fully human and fully divine. And then we know that he took our place upon the cross. He became our substitute. Jesus died on the cross. Uh, though he was innocent, he, was, he had never sinned. He, had, uh, he, he was fully human but without sin. And he then became the perfect sacrifice, the perfect substitute to take your place and absorb your sins and my sins. When he hung there on the cross for six hours on Calvary, Shedding his blood. They pierced his hands and feet. And his brow pierced his side with the spear. And he died. Crying out. It is finished. And he finished the work. Of, for our atonement. Atonement means at one moment. He made us one again. He, he took the separation of our sin. And obliterated it. He crushed the head of the serpent at that moment. And he won forgiveness for part of your sins? No, for all of your sins. Past, present, and even future have all been paid for on the cross of Jesus. How do I know that they were paid for? Well, on the third day, he rose from the dead. And that resurrection was a sign. It was a sign that said you're forgiven. You don't have to pay for your sins. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Somebody say hallelujah. We don't have to pay for our sins. Because there is one who loved us so much. He loved you so much. That he was willing to take your sins away. All you have to do is trust him. Believe in him and trust him. Well, they took him down from the cross. They buried him in a rich man's tomb, a borrowed tomb. But then uh, what did he do uh, uh, when he died? Uh, that, he was dead, humanly speaking. His body was dead. But spiritually, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, he descended into Hades. He descended into the grave. He descended into the place where the Old Testament saints were waiting for him. He descended into what was called 
called paradise. Remember, he told the thief on the cross that this day you'll be with me in paradise. And he descended into Hades and he walked into where the bosom of Abraham, where all the Old Testament saints, David was there, Samson was there, Gideon was there, Moses was there, Abraham was there. And he said, ta-da. <laughs> I'm the one you've been waiting for. You see, they had to believe in Jesus, but they didn't know his name. He was a shadow. But when he showed up on that, on that, during that burial time, it says he led captivity captive. He emptied paradise. He emptied paradise. And he took them right into the presence of the Father. He rose from the dead. Well, then after he rose from the dead, he was resurrected. What did he do? Well, he hung around for about 40 days. <laughs> yeah, seriously, he hung around with the disciples. Uh, he would come and go, but he, he, would, he would show up. He'd eat breakfast with them by the seashore. He'd eat a meal with them in the upper room. He would show up and then disappear. He'd hung around for 40 days. But then at the end of the 40 days, he said, don't leave Jerusalem. Don't leave the city until you receive the promise from the Father. Until you receive power. If you try to live this Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to mess it up. I mean, we mess it up so many times anyway, but can you imagine what it would be like to try to do this without the Holy Spirit? He hung around for about 40 days, and then at the end of the 40 days, he led them out of the city. And it says that while he was talking to them, he started to rise up in the air. <laughs> now, that must have been something. He ascended up and he kept rising and they were standing there looking and looking and looking until a cloud passed between them. And suddenly they were, there were two men dressed in white that were next to him, next to them and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has ascended, will someday return in the same way. In the same way. What did he do? Where was he going? Well, he gave us lots of hints. He told the disciples in John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You trust in God, trust also in me. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I promise I'll come back for you. That where I am, you may be also. Ten days after that, after the ascension, was the day of Pentecost. That's what we're going to celebrate next Sunday. And then the last part of the creed is that someday Jesus will return for his bride, the church, in the rapture. He will set up his literal kingdom here on earth, his literal kingdom and reign for a thousand years called the millennial reign of Christ literally here on earth. And then at the end of that will be the final great white throne judgment. That's all the gospel right there. That's the gospel story. But listen, the, and the, what's the, the word gospel means good news. How in the world is that story good news? It's good news when you apply it to your life. It's power when you apply it to your life. It'll change you when you apply it to your life. Otherwise, it's just a nice, it's an interesting story. But once you apply it to your life, that's when the good news becomes good news. And it'll change and transform your life. Yes. Yes. So how does the ascension into heaven fit into God's promise, purpose? You know, why, why did he have to go? In fact, that was part of what the disciples were asking him in verse 6. Did you notice that? They said to him, Lord, are you now, is it time now for you to, to set up your kingdom and return and restore your kingdom to Israel? Is that what you're going to do now? And listen to me, that's a good question. 
He'd already rose from the dead, conquering sin and death. He'd already conquered the grave. Why didn't he just set up his kingdom right then and there? Well, there's a good reason. He had to go away. In fact, he even told his disciples in John chapter 14 through 16. He said, I must go away. Do you remember? He told the disciples, I've got to go away. I, I, I must go away. If I don't go away, the counselor cannot come. If I don't go away, the comforter cannot come. If I don't go away, the Holy Spirit cannot come. I've got to go away. But I love that verse in verse 18, chapter 14 of 18, verse 18 in John. He says, but I won't leave you as orphans. I won't leave you as orphans. Now, this is my point. Do you suppose that the ascension back into heaven, that that when Jesus left the disciples and ascended back into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father on the throne in heaven, do you suppose that was our adoption? That was our adoption. Beth and I have some very good friends that uh, live in Cincinnati, Kevin and Tani Job, they've visited here on occasion. Kevin was part of the staff there when I was at Sharonville in Cincinnati. Uh, and uh, they, they're a wonderful family. Uh, they have three biological children. And then they went and adopted two little girls from, two babies uh, from China. Uh, and uh, one of them just graduated from high school in Cincinnati. So it's been a little while. But that, that's been an interesting journey. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they adopted these two little girls and they fit right in. And it's just an incredible family. And they just have a wonderful ministry. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, the questions people would ask, and maybe you're asking the question, what would what be the reason for an adoption like that? Well, for nurture, maybe they just had a desire to nurture more than just three kids. They wanted to nurture a bunch of kids. Maybe it was because they cared so much. Maybe it was because they had too much love, too much love. They just had to share more love with with little ones and grow and... In Bible times, adoption also had other reasons. It, it was in, in Bible time. In fact, some of these reasons are still prevalent in the world today. They, people adopt in order to secure succession. In order to have a legacy. They, they adopt in order to have someone take care of them in their old age. And so they adopt you. Seriously, that's what in, in many parts of the world, that, that is part of their reasoning. Sometimes they adopt because of inheritance. An inheritance. But listen, whatever the reason, whatever the reason for adoption, and there are many reasons, one thing is for sure adoption pulls you into a bigger story. It pulls you into a bigger story, into a bigger and greater purpose. These little girls in China, in whatever province that the Jobs had to go and find them and adopt them and go through all the paperwork and all of that. Those little girls, they were, they were probably from very poor uh, peasant families. Uh, uh, but now they've been brought into a bigger story than their little minds had ever dreamt of. Same thing applies to us. You see, what does Paul say? Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. All the things God has in store for you. 
Listen, God's plan and God's purpose is bigger than you can imagine. God's plan and purpose, he's, his story, his story involves you. His story involves Trinity Church. His story involves you and me and this moment. His, ter- his story, his purpose and plan and adoption. That's how we get to be a part of the story. He adopts us into the family. He adopts us into the inheritance. He adopts us into the bigger story. Can you see it? Can you see it? That's why Christ adopted you. Not to leave you as he found you. But to bring you into a greater purpose and plan. Listen, the, the adoption, the, the ascension of Jesus, of the resurrected Jesus, it was an adoption. You and I have been adopted into the family of God. We're part of the family. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. And the resurrected human Jesus is now seated on the throne And according to Colossians chapter 3, that means that you and I are too. We are seated with him in the heavenly places. Let me just go on a little bit of a rabbit trail right now, if you don't mind. But, you know, can you imagine what it was like for Jesus to return to heaven? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, when, when he left heaven's throne, I'm sure the angels were scratching their heads and they were trying to figure, what is he up to now? This doesn't make any sense at all. Why would he humiliate himself? Why would he even care about those, those earthlings? Why would he do all of that? But when he rose from the dead and then ascended back into heaven... Can you imagine what it was what the can you imagine what the victory parade was like? <laughs> can you imagine the celebration when when he returned victoriously triumphant and then sat down at the right hand of the Father on the throne and can you imagine can you imagine heaven at that moment? Well, if you can If you can imagine that, then you can also imagine maybe what it's like for a child of God to return, to go into heaven, and to be welcomed into the arms of the Savior who shed his blood for you and for me. This morning, let me give you, and I'm going to move through them quickly, but let me give you seven benefits Seven benefits of Jesus' ascension back into heaven. First of all, when he ascended back into heaven, he established his reign over all powers and authorities. He said, all all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me in the name of Jesus All authority in heaven and earth has been given. He reigns. When he ascended back into heaven, he established his reign and rulership. He's in control. Not the coronavirus, not the government, not the governor, not not even you are in charge. God is the one that's in charge. I know it doesn't always look like it, but he is all authority. All power. Secondly, he gives access in Jesus. The ascension of Jesus gives us access to the throne, to God's throne for grace and mercy. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16 tells us how that he was the great high priest who has gone through the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold firmly to our faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just like us. He has, uh, he is without sin yet then we can approach his throne of grace with confidence. He gives us confidence to approach the throne of God. 
Thirdly, we have an advocate. We have an advocate in heaven right now. We have an advocate uh, who is praying for us and interceding for us. And, and, and an advocate is, is you, have a, you have a defense attorney. Did you know that? You have a defense attorney in heaven right now on the throne of God. And you say, well, what do I need a defense for? I'll tell you why. Because the devil is accusing you. The devil is slandering you. The devil accuses us before the throne. He does. That's what the, the word devil means. Devil means accuser. You have, you, have a, you have a prosecuting attorney. and You have the devil who is accusing you. But hallelujah, you've got an advocate now. You've got a defense attorney. And every time the devil opens his mouth, he, Jesus steps forward and says, yes, but they're covered by the blood. You've got a defense attorney who understands our weaknesses. He knows our trials. He knows what we've gone through and he is the perfect defense attorney and advocate so I don't care how much we mess up I don't care how far we've fallen away how badly how many times listen we have an advocate with the father whose blood is sufficient to cover all of our sins and to make a perfect defense for us every time and he shuts the devil's mouth he shuts the devil's mouth Number four, he gives us the spoils of Christ's victory. That's what the ascension means. It means that he gives us the spoils of the victory. In other words, he takes back what the devil took from us. He, we, he took back what the devil stole from us. John 10.10 10 says that, that the thief comes to kill, rob, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. He took back what the devil had stolen. And the ascension gives us authority to take back the spoils in Christ's victory. Number five, the ascension of Jesus keeps us longing for his return. That's what the disciples were doing. They were standing there looking up. And then throughout the epistles you find where Jesus, where the disciples were saying, you know, they were longing for him to come back. They're, listen, this world is not our home. It's not our home. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I promise I'll come back for you that where I am, you may be also. Hallelujah. It keeps us longing for his return. And that longing for his return gives us hope. It purifies us. You know, when you talk about the return of Jesus to some people, that it causes them to be afraid. Why? Because they don't want him to come back. They don't want him to come back. They, they, are, they know judgment is coming. They, they know that there's no such thing as a free lunch. They know that the, there's judgment. No, every, Jesus even said it. Every word that comes out of your mouth, there's going to be an accounting. Judgment is coming. But we long for his coming. Why? Because we know that he's returning for his own. Those who belong to him. And that purifies us. It changes. When you know that he's coming back. It changes the way you live. Doesn't it? It changes the way you. It changes what you value. You know, if, if, if this world is all that there is, well then, no wonder you, you, you spend all your time trying to houses and cars and goods and, and, all the big, and wealth and bank accounts because that's what matters in this world. But listen, when you're longing for his return, you have a different sense of set of values. You understand that this world is perishing. And that there's many things in the Lord that can never be taken away from you. Not only that, but it changes the way you relate to people. You know, it changes the way you, re it changes the way you live. You know, because you know that he could return at any moment. 
Number six, and to get this one, the ascension of Jesus multiplies Jesus. Okay, it, it, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, but then when he ascended back into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit down to us, and now there are a million Jesuses in the world right now. Do you see that? He multiplied himself through the Holy Spirit that he sent back. We are his children, and greater is the one who's in us than the one who's in the world. And finally, this, the ascension of Jesus, so it, it was necessary so that the Holy Spirit could come and abide, fill us and empower us and draw us into the bigger story. You see, there, there's a lot of people that, that in this world, sadly, who don't have a clue of the bigger story. In, in fact, they think, <laughs> they think that they are the star of the story. They, they, they think that they, it's all about them. They don't have a clue of this bigger story. This greater purpose. Jesus ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father in order to seal our adoption and set the stage for the greater story. The bigger story. Let me conclude with another adoption. There's a, I read about this. About a, a, fam, a Williams family. They adopted four children. Pretty much at once. And you think how in the world. And, and it was rather easy. They adopted four children at once. Uh, because there was very little, there wasn't any waiting list. You see, all the children that they adopted were special needs. And the Williams, they adopted a son who was Down syndrome. They adopted two daughters and another son who had major birth defects. And all, all, of, all four of the children were difficult to place until the Williams family came along. Why? Because the Williams family wanted them. They wanted children that no one else wanted. They wanted children that no one else wanted. It, what would they do? They were pulling these four children into a bigger story. They were pulling them into a new family. They were pull, pulling them into a greater purpose. I don't know the names of the mom and dad. All I know is the Williams family. But the Williams were extraordinary parents. And they had an extraordinary family. A much bigger story. And oh, the, the story also, the article also talked about the joy. <laughs> the joy in that family was off the charts. The joy in that family was off the charts and the witness of their love everybody was talking about. Hebrews 12 2 says it was for the joy set before Jesus that he endured the cross. He went through the suffering because of the joy that was on the other side. Papa God, our Father, has a special heart for those who have been rejected. For those that the world doesn't, doesn't recognize. Doesn't think are. Doesn't want. But Father God has great grace. For those who have been disabled by sin. Jesus, Jesus was sent in order to adopt us. His ascension sealed the deal. Uh, he, and he wants, to, he wants you to bear his name now. He wants you to bear his name, belong to him. He wants you to remember who you are and whose you are. And just as the angels said, to the men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus 
who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. He's going to return in the clouds. He's going to return. He's coming back soon for his children. And my question this morning is, are you one of them? Are you ready for his return? Have you been adopted? Have you been adopted? He chose you and he's calling you right now. And all you need to do is just say yes. It's purely by grace through faith. All you have to do is say yes and join the family. He's calling you into his bigger story. I invite you right now to pray with me. If our worship team will come back. Let's pray. Heavenly Father this morning. For those that are here. But those who may be watching on live streaming. Or on uh, the YouTube. Or wherever we post this. Lord I pray. That your Holy Spirit. Would transcend time and space. And that Lord you would. Draw us into the bigger story, into the greater purpose. Would you adopt us, Lord? Would you seal the deal this morning? Lord, would you, would you look upon every heart, Lord, and, and, and those that maybe the world has rejected, those who uh, may not feel wanted, Lord, would you let them know that they are wanted by you, that you want them, and that you want all of us as your children, as your children, to belong to you, Lord. Oh, Lord, I pray that Maybe there are some this morning that are going to start that new story, that bigger story, by just simply saying, yes, Lord, forgive my sins, come into my heart, adopt me, Lord. I need, I need you, Lord. I need you, Papa. Would you adopt me? Would you make me part of your family? Take away my sins through the blood of your son. Jesus and give me your Holy Spirit grant it Lord I pray this morning in the name of Jesus Amen let's sing will you stand with me people up here that are going to pray with you. If you'd like prayer this morning, just invite you to come. If you just want to pray at the altar, you can do that too. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. And I am a child of God. I'm no longer Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just say yes to him this morning. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Your love has called my name. I've been born again. This is your day. To your family. This is your moment. Your blood flows Give him your heart this morning. my veins. I am a child of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm not. I am a child yes, of God. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Yes. I am a child. 
say yes, Lord. We say yes, Lord. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Hallelujah. If you need prayer, don't leave the sanctuary without getting a word of prayer this morning. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Folks, it's time for a confession this morning, okay? Can you confess with me? I am a child of God. I'm a child of God. Not because I deserved it. Not because I earned it, but because of what he did for me. And all I did was receive the gift this morning. That's all I did is receive the gift. Okay, let's say it again. I am a child of God. No longer a slave of fear. I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart, and you shall be saved. And from this moment on, things are going to be different. They are going to be different. Because the one who now lives in you is greater than the one who's in the world. Hallelujah. You've been adopted. Hallelujah. You bear his name. You've been adopted into the family. Now you're part of a bigger family. Part of a bigger story. A greater purpose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And give you peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Bishop.